Hi, Peter. How are you? Oh, well, thank you. How are you, Park? Very good. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for attending or joining this uh, interview. I'm really appreciate it. Uh, first of all, uh, a lot of uh, my guests, they are more or less friends of mine and I, not many uh, people watching this video, but hopefully we can encourage more people to make their voice or, you know, find more hidden gem in our industry. And first of all, I met Peter in 2009 and he was my teacher at RMIT University in Melbourne. And I was just a really second year bachelor student, so didn't have much knowledge about architecture. But we uh, currently had some chat and I'm really uh, appreciate Peter joining this discussion, and especially he's an um, associate architect and also as a BIM manager in his organization. And there are a lot to talk about it. Peter, welcome. And could you please introduce yourself? Um, well, I don't know if I can do better than that. Um, <clears throat> Yes, uh, I'm uh, Peter, um, well, born and raised in Melbourne. Um, I graduated in about 2008 uh, from RMIT with a Masters of Architecture. Um, although I had dabbled previously in some arts and science. Um, and prior to working at uh, Denton Court Commercial, where I am now, um, I'd been, uh, well, been working as an architect um, for you know 10 years or so I suppose um, and all during that time as well I've been teaching at RMIT um, and although I teach some tech subjects and a few Revit electives uh, I've mainly been um, a design studio leader um, and uh, supervising uh, thesis students uh, for their graduating projects um, yeah, so, you know, that, that's about me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, pretty busy um, working full time at the same time teaching. I really think it's um, hard work. Um, I took how, a, yeah. Oh, it's, sorry. It's, I was going to say. It's balance, no? Somehow. Can you? Yeah. Oh, look, the, <clears throat> the balance normally works. Um, last semester, I actually took a semester off from teaching for the first time in 11 years or something. And, um, yeah, it was it was very weird to have time in the evening. Mm. Um, yeah, and uh, didn't really quite know what to do with it. So I'm back teaching this semester, um, but it's so enjoyable, you know. So um, yeah, the the balance doesn't really come into it because it's just it's really good fun, even at the end of the day. Wow, eleven years! Oh my god, it's amazing. How did uh, you well, gain like your knowledge, sorry, um, and experience um, with Beam? Um. Oh, I'd like to think the hard way. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I really came to BIM through um, just working as an architect. Um, and uh, back then it was principally AutoCAD. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, pretty much everything in 2D. And I don't know, I suppose um, I started to get interested in, you know, making AutoCAD work a bit more efficiently. And um, I mean, I really had no ability with any scripting or um, or anything like that, but certainly just sort of pushing the program to be as efficient as possible um, and, um, and starting to create um, standards and things like that um, to try and speed things up. And I suppose that approach, which then allowed me to work quite efficiently um, you know, I, I just sort of uh, took that through the various practices I worked at, but um, the big change was when I, which must be about seven or eight years ago now, um, moved to a practice called Workshop Architecture. Um, and I was being hired as a project architect um, to lead some small projects, but uh, they wanted me to implement Revit in the office. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't really used Revit up until that point, mm -hmm. um, but I think I probably spoke about AutoCAD in a way that gave them confidence. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, then I just had to um, learn Revit as I um, did these projects. And, uh, yeah, I, it was pretty difficult, uh, you know, when there's no one to ask. Um, you just have to work it out yourself and mm -hmm. the drawings still have to go out. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it was uh, tough to learn, but... Um, yeah, very much just um, sort of necessity, um, but also, you know, I, I could see that there was uh, efficiency and, you know, just get more work done as an architect. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, but it, it's really good because you've gone through all the passes like using AutoCAD and then you working as a project architect like more than 10 years and at the same time you like seven eight years ago people using Revit already pioneer i would say that like seven <laughs> eight years ago in central europe i don't think many people use Revit. i know in australia it's technology things a bit faster than europe i think but uh, europe yeah. is a little bit slower than um in my opinion slower than australia but yeah. yeah seven eight years ago not many people use Revit anyway so you're already pretty fast uh, than ordinary. Yeah, look, yeah. And, and especially, um, you know, for the kind of work we were doing or using Revit on, which was, you know, sort of smaller residential jobs mm -hmm. initially, mm -hmm. um, there weren't too many practices doing that or small practices. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we, we found a lot of efficiency mm -hmm. really early on with it. Um, well, you know, after a year or two, once I'd kind of worked out how to use it and, it, you know, mm -hmm. built the content library and, Mm. Um, but um, yeah, look, it's probably only in the last sort of you know three or four years where it feels like Revit has really been adopted uh, in Australia as the as the main way to uh, to work as architects. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I know that's not entirely true, but um, yeah, certainly now it's not difficult to you know get everybody uh, producing in Revit. Yeah, yeah. So it's implemented already. Um, what is your I, it's a, I wouldn't usually talk about software, but what is your favorite software or programming if you have something and why? <clears throat> um, yeah, I thought about this question quite a lot um, and it's a really, really, really difficult question. Mm. Um, so I think there's a, there's a couple of answers. Um, if I'm being completely honest, and these are things that I use every day, um, so favorite software must be the snipping tool mm -hmm. in Windows. <laughs> And probably yeah. Notepad plus plus, yeah, um, yeah, and even yeah. just Notepad, uh, yeah. you know, it just, uh, yeah, the simplicity, you know, it does one thing and it does it very well, and yeah, um, yeah I've never had an angry moment with any of those bits of software where I'm sure, you know, if you've ever tried to format something in Word, um, you know, you can get pretty upset. Um, I do have sort of Stockholm syndrome for both AutoCAD and mm. Excel, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, just because they're difficult. Um, mm. And yeah, I find the, the world of AutoCAD quite a strange one. Mm -hmm. um, it's a strange place to be. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's, um, yeah, I sort of, I, I don't like using it in some ways, but I'm also really, really impressed by it. You know, it's sort of mm. kind of an amazing piece of software. Um, in terms of actually enjoying software, um, it's usually more stuff like um, Photoshop and Premiere Pro and things like that, you know, but sure. those just feel like fun pieces of software to use. So we always enjoy turning them on. Mm. Um, and then the software that I'm kind of really impressed with at the moment um, is probably... Um, Visual Studio. Yeah. Because sure. again, I'm just sort of amazed at, you know, mm. how clever it is, um, you know, how quickly the IntelliSense pops up. And, you know, like I just kind of, you know, you're sitting there trying to program and you think, mm -hmm. well, someone programmed all of this and, you know, like I'm an idiot and they're geniuses. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, in terms of programming languages, uh, I mean, the thing is, yeah, I haven't been programming for very long, so it's sort of early days. But mm -hmm. um, the first thing that I learned was C Sharp. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, still kind of trying to get a bit better at that. Mm -hmm. um, I've sort of started using a bit of Python. Mm -hmm. um, and that's partly because of Dynamo in Revit, but mm -hmm. mostly... Um, programming in Raspberry Pis, you know, mm -hmm. just for fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I suppose design script in Dynamo, I've mm -hmm. sort of started to feel quite confident with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I really like SQL. Um, mm -hmm. well, wow. That's a strange thing to like, I think. But mm -hmm. um, And, again, I'm not very advanced with it, but, uh, 
it's it's one of those things just there's a simplicity to it and it just sort of does what you want it to mm. um the thing the programming language that i really hate um are things like dax mm. um and uh, php i absolutely loathe <laughs> um and uh and auto lisp um wow i've been doing a lot of recently and it's so frustrating <laughs> wow that's um, crazy Mm-hmm. Yeah, and look, it's worth saying that I'm not very good at any of those. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, they're, they're kind of the languages that you just have to dip into from time to time and sort of mm-hmm. you know quickly learn something mm-hmm. to uh, to achieve whatever it is, and then move on to the next thing. But mm-hmm. um, I think you know C sharp is one that I've sort of kept coming back to. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I think having learned some C sharp. It's made all of the other languages make a lot more sense as well. Wow, wow! I mean, yeah. even though I mean, who is advanced users if, these days? Anyway, you can Google it and pretty much find source code or GitHub and digging yes. and copy, copy and paste. And so yeah. the thing is, it's important thing is that you like browsing and take take a look at all the opportunities what you can use and you referencing the idea each other. And I think it's really. Um, good practice i think in running um programming and also when you talk about this uh, notepad or um excel it's like it's kind of software but it, it is actually um these these basic um window applications they actually can do a lot of advanced uh, things with formulas and stuff like that so yes. I think you, I, I can imagine what you like about it. And yeah, sometimes when you get tired of it, yeah, Photoshop is perfect, I think. <laughs> you, <laughs> like an artifact or some um, fake images would, would be always nice, you know. <laughs> so I it's see, true. yeah, exactly. But just by hearing it, it's very interesting. And I think students or the, the architects nowadays, they think about, um, um, software differently and what makes me surprised is that you didn't just say directly i like revit or i like archigit or something like that you know because well, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not crazy yeah uh... <laughs> <laughs> because um, a lot of case people just or be manager or technical person straight forward <clears throat> say i i like revit or you know I, my favorite is revit or something like that but your 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 answer is very interesting actually yeah. I think, you know, in, in some regards, it's a bit like sort of saying, um, you know, I just like architecture. It's mm-hmm. like, I think you can be a little bit more specific. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, so, yeah, you might like civic architecture mm-hmm. or, you know, small residential mm-hmm. additions or, you know, like I think there's a level of specificity which mm-hmm. you sort of need, I think, um, because otherwise it's a bit general. And, you know, mm-hmm. like Revit is just a bit of general software yeah. that, works reasonably well but um it's much more just down the kind of the you know it's just a blunt tool sure, sort yeah. of thing um but i think all of the other ancillary software mm. it's you know where just the sheer enjoyment of using the software is probably mm. um thing whereas revit you know it's um uh, I, I suppose it, it feels a lot more like a means to an end mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you're right yeah you're right. It's just a nine to five job. <laughs> <laughs> what about parametric design? I mean, programming, sure, it's something you can make a generative design or parametric design um, tool as an architect, but it's actually quite important everyday practice these days. And how do you think in reality, do you think the parametric design or this methodology within, using programming is help your BIM uh, workflow? in reality um it's been well it, recently it's been critical um mm. that we're able to use parametric design and really in this case um although there's a few people in the office that have um fairly good grasshopper um mm-hmm. and rhino skills because our deliverable is frequently a BIM model um, mm-hmm. that's you know, fully attributed and all the rest of it. Um, sometimes it's easier just to build it uh, natively in Revit. So we use Dynamo, mm-hmm. um, which can be a little bit slower with geometry and things mm-hmm. like that, but um, you know, gets there in the end. 
Um, and certainly for things like um, we were doing sort of bridge designs mm. where we were just getting, um, you know, uh, 3D line mm -hmm. strings mm -hmm. uh, from the engineer um, and that keeps getting revised mm -hmm. and you keep having to rebuild your bridge, yep. um, you know, which is a number of components, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of the... Uh, the concrete and the handrails and then the, you know, I don't know, we had sort of a batten treatment and, mm -hmm. you know, so there was a bit of stuff going on mm -hmm. um, and the ability to keep just regenerating it, yep. you know, every, every time um, was incredibly important, but also just um, in terms of the sort of design optioneering that we could um, change the way. Um, I mean, I suppose one of the key design elements in there was the sort of the, the, paneling and the battening and mm -hmm. and that we were able to manipulate that um, mm -hmm. quite fluidly mm -hmm. um and i mean you know sort of trying to do it manually um mm -hmm. would wouldn't be impossible but you'd, you'd find a you'd find a different design yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i mean for stuff like that it's just um it, it's been uh indispensable can't imagine not yeah. doing it that way sure um and, you know, for a lot of more sort of uh, maybe less um, less complete but still really important, um, I mean, you know, quite often we want to do something where we randomise a facade mm -hmm. um, treatment and it might be just the angle on the panel or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's a combination of building Revit families which mm -hmm. can take those parameters and mm -hmm. then uh, scripting something which will randomise um, mm -hmm. And both being able to, you know, do a whole lot of options, but then also being able to sort of record that setting and then be able to play it back. Yeah. Because inevitably, you know, the design mm -hmm. architect would be like, go back to that one, three, three, mm -hmm. you know, iterations before. <laughs> but it's random. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that kind of thing's been, um, again, you know, really important and, and just being able to, you know, like random is kind of a funny thing. Nobody actually wants random. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Random means you might get three or four of the same thing all together. Yeah, yeah. And then, it, you know, so you, you want sort of an abstracted random. Mm -hmm. um, but being able to get that sort of script to react to building components, you know, so the treatment's mm -hmm. slightly different. Say, I don't know if it's a curtain panel, you know, the spandrels will tend to... Mm -hmm happen around where the floors are yeah um <laughs> yeah, but still trying to sort of trying you know work. yeah make it random yeah um yeah so yeah I, I i sort of can't imagine not being able to um use parametric design um mm. and although we're not using it so much as the initial generator yeah um for form certainly in terms of resolving some of those um smaller items or yeah. just you know actually building the the model yeah um yeah it, it, it's um a critical part of the workflow right i think it's very in my opinion it's very important it's not only um about form finding or randomizing i mean there is no random as you say it's uh based on feed and it's kind of mm different iterations uh, but i think when you talk about infrastructure when you design bridge or street then this axis based on that um, all the repeating work can be re-engineered uh, re and i think this efficiency is also very important and i see uh, these kind of uh, parametric design or generative design solution is also very strong in early stage when you start to analyze or like simulate some kind of uh, nowadays, structural engineers even using it for structural analysis or energy consultants also reviewing mm. the design uh, for their simulation using different parameters. And I think it's very important and getting more and more important. I think uh, a lot of BIM managers actually, they might ignore this, but in eventually everyone needs it, right? So I think it's very important um, things. And lots of, so. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, was, I mean, I, I think um, <clears throat> in some respects, you know, the, the terms like sort of parametric design mm. um, have been maybe um, can, can be associated with a kind of um, form making and it's mm. a, almost an, a, an aesthetic mm -hmm. um, of uh, complexity. Um, and, you know, I, 
I find a lot of that stuff really interesting mm. um, at a sort of conceptual level, but I think it does put a lot of people off and that actually, you know, quite often, I mean, parametric design, at least for me, mm -hmm. uh, is often, um, you know, sort of less exciting results, but it's really about sort of optimization sure. of, you know, architectural components, even if it's in a fairly, you know, sort of standard building, you know, mm -hmm. it <clears throat> doesn't look too crazy, but um, that ability to optimize, mm -hmm. um, uh, through parametric design, um, you know, it's it's the it's the less exciting kind of end of it. But I think it's probably where, you know, you can make sort of ninety percent of the gains. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's probably just partly a, a you know, um, a bit of a PR exercise yeah. in some regards. Um, <laughs> that you know, parametric design really gets associated not just with um, you know, that kind of hyper complexity, mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, the kind of the brutal simplicity down the other end. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, you know, it's beneficial to both. That's right. Um, so we talked about already many, many topics, but it um, could be a tricky question. What is your perspective on BIM and in our industry? Is that um, present oh, or future or what is it? You know, it, it looks like it's catching on. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> no, look, I reckon it's a really interesting place to be um, in that, you know, there's a lot of kind of new development. Um, there's quite a lot of optimism um, about what can be offered and what can be achieved. Mm. Um, and there's an awful lot of challenges in, you know, how to deliver it. Um, and it is sort of a rapidly changing thing. So, you know, the like even just in Melbourne, the sort of, you know, the, the BIM environment we were working in three years ago mm -hmm. is gone. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, it's different. The clients have moved on, the contractors have moved on, the architects mm -hmm. have moved on, like everybody's perspective uh, and expectations has, mm -hmm. you know, Increased, uh, yeah. stepped up to the next level, um, mm -hmm. you know, which is... Um, Pretty exciting. And, and some of that is, um, so in Victoria, um, mm -hmm. which is the, the state, uh, right down, well, not right down, but second from the bottom uh, mm -hmm. on Australia, mm -hmm. um, the government um, put out a thing called a um, digital assets strategy, oh, wow. uh, which was really about sort of starting to try and um, make use of BIM uh, more generally um, for state government assets, mm -hmm. so uh, or roads and infrastructure and, and things like that, but mm -hmm. um, you know, hospitals and whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So I saw the the um, benefit of the the kind of asset management strategy you mm -hmm. can achieve with um, a proper asset model, mm -hmm. um, and that for that to be successful, it needs to start early on in the design process and get carried right the way through to mm -hmm. delivery. Um, and that was a really, really, um, you know, well thought out uh, document and set of guidelines and the, the industry locally mm -hmm. has, has picked it up. So even though it might not be mandated on a project, mm -hmm. tend to find that everybody is acting like it might be on the next project. Yeah. So, um, yeah, all of a sudden we're seeing a lot more of, um, I'm going to try and remember the numbers now, um, mm -hmm. pass uh, 1192 mm -hmm. um, and um, was it AS 19650? Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of those um, kind of standards have really been adopted wholesale. Um, and, you know, that was just a change in sort of one or two years. But mm -hmm. um, because that had been picked up by government, um, yeah. it, it just, everybody adopted it straight away. Okay, um, so in Australia, the situation you guys are referencing a lot, the UK standard, as far as I hear. And yeah. is it like all the governmental project mandatory now in Australia, like with, with BIM strategy uh, methodology? It's, or? It's, it's not mandatory. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, like oh, we use BIM on all our projects mm -hmm. um, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, just because of you know internal efficiencies, yeah. Um, but yeah, now you know contractors are expecting at least a three D model. Okay. Um, 
if, if not a BIM model. Mm -hmm. um, and then quite a lot of our clients won't accept okay. uh, anything, anything but a BIM model that's fully attributed. Really? Wow, um, that's cool. Yeah, so I mean, you know, like it's 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 a tricky time in the industry in that mm. um, you know some clients don't really know what BIM is and aren't interested, mm -hmm. um, whereas others are you know really pushing forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the office, you know, we we're, we're sort of trying to adopt you know the highest level of BIM, yeah, um, which means that sometimes it's sort of overkill for some of the other projects. Mm. But um, you know, again, it's that sort of thing of in another five years, those projects that weren't very sort of BIM focused probably will be. Mm. And the ones that are focused now are going to be, I don't know, off doing something else um, entirely. You know, it'll probably just get sort of downloaded straight into your brain and, you know, off you'll go. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, the, the industry's, um, I suppose, I think it's past the crossroads. You know, mm. BIM's been fully adopted. Um, and you know everybody's pushing forward with it there's still areas which haven't caught up um but in a certain sense you know they, they don't matter mm -hmm. um it's uh it's, it's all about where the kind of leading edge is um yeah. and um yeah and there's just sort of no sense of it kind of yeah. slowing down yeah um, yeah 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 so i think you know it's a re really interesting part of the industry mm -hmm. and also government like government or state they start to uh, regulate it from the like, governmental level these days. And that's, I think, um, the future where you talked about asset um, in your state. Uh, it's very important components for us, like that we don't mm. have to use our own standard. We can just use governmental standard uh, for this yes. uh, public project. I think that's the like a bright future for <laughs> the beam industry, I think. Um, it seems like everyone these days um, calls by themselves BIM manager. I don't know. I, as far as I know, I, I was a BIM manager before uh, for three years in a big large organization. We had like around 800 people all together with engineers and architects. And I was luckily involved in many different project meetings as a BIM manager. And there, from consultant, from engineers, from clients, they have always been manager, right? And <laughs> in the meeting. And I think sometimes some of them politically just has a role as a BIM manager. They really don't know what that is, but somehow they still put them <laughs> as a BIM manager. And I think it's, um, I found this a little bit funny because, because, because of the project meeting, they have to put someone in you know as a BIM manager from their organization but it doesn't mean that they actually yeah. proper BIM manager <laughs> and how important BIM manager's role in reality or do you feel I don't know when I, I feel sometimes project manager or project architect is much more important role than BIM manager in reality but how how is your feeling about it oh look I suppose um it goes to one of the issues of being a BIM manager, or I don't know, that's that's what I call my role. Mm -hmm. um, and then if anybody asked me, well, what does that mean? Like, what do you do? Mm -hmm. I sort of go, oh, I'm not sure. You know, like mm -hmm. it's a it's a different a difficult um, role to describe um, because it's so sort of multifaceted, mm -hmm. um, uh, constantly evolving, and you know, one week just doesn't look like the next. Um, and I mean, you know, all of last week, I was pretty much just working in AutoCAD, mm. you know, I wasn't doing very much kind of anything that looked like a BIM thing at all. But then, um, you know, next week is going to be all BIM 360 and setting up projects and, mm. you know, um, writing scripts to add parameters to things. And, you know, so like it's, it's, yeah, it's hard to pin down what I'm doing a lot of the time, but um yeah, I think the role of the BIM manager, <clears throat> um, I mean, there's certainly aspects where, you know, you are the person that needs to um, broadly come up with the standards for the office mm -hmm. um, and sort of, um, you know, work out how you're adopting 
BIM and like what the BIM strategy is, mm -hmm. um, that then sort of translates to then coming up with, um, you know, acceptable practice. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of how you're going to do things, mm -hmm. um, you know, so not going to do everything with detail lines and, you know, <laughs> uh, you're going to use it properly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's sort of a, there's an education role in there. Um, and also, you know, you do have to be sort of quite conscious of, you know, what might be coming in the future mm. in that I've found a lot of my role or where it's been successful has been where I've uh, future-proofed mm -hmm. um, elements of our practice so that, like, you know, when we do get this um, Victorian digital asset strategy coming in and, mm. and you know, people are sort of um, adopting that, well, you know, we're kind of ready to go. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have to fundamentally change the way we do things. Mm -hmm. um, so that sort of future proofing aspect of, mm -hmm. of how we practice, I think, mm -hmm. um, is probably a, a kind of a key role. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I do a, quite a lot of, I mean, I often sort of think a lot of the questions that I get um, from staff, you know, 80% of them are actually architectural questions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, probably only 20% are actually purely technical questions. So mm -hmm. I do find um, the kind of the BIM manager role still relies an awful lot on architecture and mm -hmm. architectural knowledge and also just, you know, around delivery. Mm -hmm. um, You're right. So, uh, yeah, look, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a funny role. I, I do agree that quite often um, the term just gets applied to people that might be sort of more closely sort of thought of as as model managers mm -hmm. you know, it, it might be someone that's pretty good at revit um mm. that's you know doing something but i think the the bim manager um role is really it's much more expansive mm -hmm. um and to a certain degree you know you do have to kind of pull yourself out of projects a little bit and mm -hmm. And take that wide view across basically, yep. you know, every project mm -hmm. in the office, mm -hmm. and also then think, and then what's it going to be in three years, mm -hmm. five years, ten years? Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it's way too hard to describe to people yep. what it is. You know, if you're at a party and you say you're a BIM manager, and they go what, and you go, mm -hmm. oh look, I'm just I'm kind of like an architect, but kind of. Mm -hmm computers yeah, yeah it's sorry like... it's a it's a tri tricky uh name actually i think it's not really position but just somehow it's inevitably uh, up <laughs> here in mind. Yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> but architects yeah it's as an architect it's um i think that's more important because at the end of the day we deliver uh, like deliver all the deliverables uh architecture mm. as because we're working in, as an architect right or structural mm. engineers they can be a BIM manager as well, but they focus more on structural engineering stuff or MEP engineers. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, and all, a lot of big organizations, they also separating between BIM manager and technical manager or like, I don't know, technology manager or something like that. Or they have more hierarchy like BIM officer, BIM, BIM leads, BIM specialist, BIM manager, yeah. BIM coordinator. There's but usually I, a few BIM, BIM gurus as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you're right. And the crossover is interesting. I work quite closely with the um, IT manager. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we certainly have a bit of crossover. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, he's fairly regretful that he has to know actually quite a lot about Revit and AutoCAD, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I, I kind of feel sorry mm -hmm. um, that that's the case. But uh, at the same time, you know, um, we work quite closely together and, you know, so I end up sort of learning quite a lot about the network mm -hmm. and the setup there because, you know, they, they do all relate to each other. Um, yeah. But I think kind of going back to that early point, I mean, the, you know, that kind of role of BIM, BIM manager is almost, I think, you know, 99%. Mm -hmm. It's a support role mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it really is about, um, you know, making sure that the architect's can do their job um, as efficiently as possible yeah. um, and hopefully as enjoyably as possible. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you have a bad Revit set up in the office, you know, you're going to be losing work and things will be corrupting mm -hmm. and, you know, anybody that's worked on a 
on a corrupted file, you know, <laughs> late at night trying to get something out. Like yeah. you have a really, really bad time. Yeah. Um, and if that's going on for months, then, you know, you're going to lose staff and, um, yeah. you know, it's a bad situation. So I think making the, the software as enjoyable as possible, or at mm -hmm. least as, you know, not uh, having it as an impediment to people's enjoyment or mm -hmm. uh, ability to do their work, I think yeah. is, is probably really the underlying yeah. sort of uh, key role. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a gray area. <laughs> yeah, it's a very controversial. For example, lots of firms, they're looking for BIM manager and they don't know like, who they who they who should they hire? I mean, who is the um, eligible to be a BIM manager? Some people say or oh, working at least five years as a practical architect and also as a project manager, then they can be a BIM manager. On the other mm -hmm. hand, or oh, they have uh, no technical like software knowledge and IT knowledge, so it should be someone who is very good in software wise, but at it's difficult to find the balance, you know, like sometimes you can maybe see some of the office hire BIM manager who just graduate from university, but they are very good in software and programming. But it doesn't mean that they know whole cycle or phase of the project, project phase. Exactly. They may, yeah. So it's very yep. difficult to question how they can hire. And they sometimes, you know, somebody who has both uh, experience and they just don't care. And I'm, I'm, they will say, I'm an architect. I don't want to be, but I still enjoy, yeah. you know, so they don't want to be BIM manager even. So it's very difficult question, but what do you think who would be the best um, to be? Oh, look, it's, yeah, it is a good question because again, it's sort of hard to say, mm -hmm. you know, what a BIM manager is, but um, mm -hmm. I think, <clears throat> you know, I, I think that sort of broad range of experience um, is is certainly important, and just having technical proficiency in software mm. is not even close to being, mm. you know, enough. Because mm. mm. um, you know, I mean, yeah, you, you can learn Revit inside out, learn what every button does. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, be able mm. to deliver or you know help deliver projects mm. um, uh, in an efficient manner. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the, you know, in, in a sense, the technical proficiency is almost, you know, the last thing you need. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing, and I mean, I suppose I can really only talk from sort of personal experience, but I think the thing that's helped me a lot has been um, having a sort of a first principles approach mm. to most problems or challenges. So mm. um, rather than sort of assuming that I know the answer, just because I knew the answer a year ago, mm -hmm. um, I usually just, you know, start from scratch every time and mm -hmm. just, you know, rebuild the problem, rebuild yeah. the solution. Yeah. Um, and in a sense, you know, I mean, that means that you, you keep finding new and better ways to do mm -hmm. things, but um, sort of applying that to everything. So both the, the technical aspects of it, um, yeah. but also just the architectural aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do think that, you know, well, if you're a BIM manager in an architectural office, I think, you know, having architectural experience is, is really critical yeah. um, because, you know, if you, if you don't have a sense of the, the kind of the cycle of the project mm. um, and, you know, what happens from concept design right through to the as-builts exactly. um, and all of those places where you can, you know, potentially mm -hmm. have problems. Yeah. Um, I mean, I certainly... I don't know. Some of the, the greatest lessons I learned was having, you know, arguments on site with a builder about mm. some joinery, you know, and mm. and then, it, you know, it, it makes you question the documentation pretty deeply mm -hmm. um, and, you know, really have a deeper understanding of, you know, the role of the contract and mm -hmm. how the specification fit into the whole thing and why nobody read it. Um, but, you know, like there's that kind of experience, which I think um, mm -hmm. is so helpful when you're, you know, at schematic design mm -hmm. and just building a window family. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> um, so I think, you know, a, a broad range of experience is really important, but I think um, as much as anything, you know, it's the, it's the approach uh, that you bring to it. Um, and yeah, but look, I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky one. Um, mm -hmm. It's very tricky. Yeah. yeah. 
And it's, I can't imagine that you'd ever kind of leave school and say, I want to be a BIM manager. Mm. Um, you know, it's sort of too difficult really to know what that is. Yeah. I think it's one of those things where it's probably over time, it's a role that you sort of start to, to yeah. towards or show an inclination to. Sure. Um, but I found the very tricky thing is there are a lot of new university course or complete faculty or even university just only focus on BIM or I don't know, some of the university they're teaching only about BIM uh, for the mm. degree as a degree level. And I found it's very f somehow <clears throat> strange because um, I don't know, in Europe, uh, Central Europe, as far as I experienced so far, last seven years, there have been managers who never even designed something before as an, in architectural practice. They don't know how competition works or how the schematic design or concept design works, but they have been manager and they have to look after the design architects as well at the same time, but they obviously just ignore them. They focus yeah. more on the coordination and documentation side. But I think this is very dangerous because <laughs> I don't know, to be honest, for me, uh, the whole this phase and process, architectural planning phases and the, uh, the stages is never just, we cannot just freeze one stage. It can go back, back and forth, you know, it's a lot of complex well, involved. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is um, one of the things we keep finding um, <clears throat> with, uh, say, something like the revision Mm -hmm. uh, system in Revit that mm -hmm. it only really allows two current <laughs> phases, right. but you know, quite often we've got a project that's actually in three phases. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's in town planning, tender, and construction all at once. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the idea of you know doing a course to be a BIM manager seems to be um, it'd be a bit like doing a course to be a project architect. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, you can't sort of. You can't get a sense of it until you've already done some of it, I think. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so I'd be I'd be skeptical yeah. um, of such a course. But I think the other thing is that it's really important to understand the mentality of the architect, because mm -hmm. um, you know architects have a particular way of working. Um, yeah. You know, and it's a you know you go and do your five year architecture course, and you come out and you think differently about things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you think differently about things than an engineer does, for instance, mm -hmm. um, or a doctor or, you know, um, or a lawyer or whatever. Like it, it's a particular way of um, thinking about things. And particularly then once you've worked in the industry for a while, mm -hmm. um, there's a whole lot of experience that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. And to then come in and, you know, potentially only offer sort of very singular solutions to things. Mm -hmm it's not the way the architect's thinking. Um, and I think, you you know, you need to be um, approaching the, the kind of the BIM management much like, a you know, an architectural project of sorts. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, nuance and, and variation within mm -hmm. what might be a simple question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's actually a lot of moving parts to it that all need to be sort yeah. of reconciled. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> all while trying to be, you know, pretty quick and efficient. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think um, I, I do sort of think, you know, an architectural training um, at least, if not some architectural experience, um, is, is kind of key. And, you know, where I've spoken to um, uh, people that work at other practices, you know, that um, where they feel the BIM manager mm. isn't, isn't that good it's mm. never because they're technically incapable mm. it's just that they don't understand you know mm. what the architect really wants out of the process mm -hmm. um and i mean that doesn't really mean that i'm always giving you know the answer that people want mm. um but at least i've got sort of a i do have a an architectural reason for doing it mm -hmm. um um yeah <laughs> whether or not it's it's the one that they wanted um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, not being able to sort of meet eye to eye is mm. problematic. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, there's a, there's a language there. Yeah, um, definitely. So it's yeah. very, it's, it's still difficult to answer all these things, but very tricky one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, I think in the future, some point, 
I still believe that there will be always be manager, even though in the future, maybe some people say this position will be, uh, uh, you know, no longer needed. Everyone will be, you know, almost the same level as being manager. But I don't think so. Maybe more information manager will do as a role as a BIM manager in the future. I, I don't know. Let's see. But um, the, the important thing is if you are, each discipline, they need to know at least what they do in terms of plannings and or if there is a contractor who has been managed, they must know what they have to do in, the, in their uh, role and responsibilities based on the new technology. And um, uh, it's, and when project meeting or BIM meeting with all the consultants involved, then the, the representative person who must know at least, you know, what's going on in this table, on this table, you know. Otherwise, um, it's just being sit there for the meeting at that saying I'm BIM manager, I think it doesn't make really sense. And um, I hope this, um, I don't know how it is now in Australia, but when I was in 2009, there was no uh, particular course for BIM in architecture degree. But I hope this kind of new uh, course would be more, at least as an elective course or something that is implemented for university students also so that they can feel there is something extra out of this uh, architectural study. And it, sometimes it's important for students to be aware of what's going on. You, I, For me, I studied 12 years to finish my master's degree, actually, because um, I was here in Korea and Australia and after that in Germany and Austria. So it was very difficult for me to finish uh, on time. But um, after graduate, what I hear is in Europe is more, more about BIM than architectural process. It's very strange feeling after graduating. So yeah. it, it's, it's, I think it's, how is it in Australia? I don't know, you are a teacher and you're, you know. Oh. Yeah, look, it's <clears throat> that's a tricky one, um, and you know, uh, you hear, um, yeah, you know, I, I suppose people that are in positions of hiring, um, you know, talk about the lack of skill from graduates, um, and you know, they they want sort of a a fully formed, ready to go architect that you know has a mm. full understanding of. Or, you know, Revit or Archicad or whatever, mm. um, ready to go. And I mean, I sort of, at, at the graduate level, I, I kind of really disagree mm. um, with that. And, and again, I'm sort of taking this from an architectural perspective that I think the, the architecture course uh, or architecture as a discipline is pretty sacred. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think it's actually, you know, it's, it's such a, um, fabulous thing to study uh and it's kind of a rare thing to study as well like there's not there's not that many um i think areas of study that allow you to um have such a broad range of influence um and expression you know within something which ultimately has this kind of technical side as well mm -hmm. um so it, it it feels you know sort of quite like ancient learning you know the arts and the sciences just being one thing mm -hmm. you know all rolled up in philosophy right um and you know you can express it all through music you know mm -hmm. like it's it, it's got um i think it's got some really nice kind of lineage uh to previous um ideas of learning and i think it's um you know something that should be hung on to in that i suppose for my um my approach and I mean, I mostly teach design, but mm -hmm. um, I've run a Revit, well, run some Revit electives, and obviously the the tech courses. But I'm never that interested in the, I suppose, the technical outcome um, or a particular proficiency that's mm. been gained. Mm. That doesn't interest me. The thing that I'm really trying to uh, foster is a sensibility, um, and you know, it does take five years to develop that architectural sensibility mm -hmm. um, about how to, you know, approach, um, you know, challenges or problems. Mm -hmm. um, and then also how to kind of turn that around um, and, you know, think of sort of where, where are the opportunities for, a, you know, a generous response 
Mm. Um, while you've got all of these competing systems and ideas, yeah. um, you know, that all have to be, you know, both sort of mitigated and entertained. Mm. Um, so I think my, my feeling is that, um, you know, at least from the architectural end of things, if you keep building that sensibility, then, you know, those people with that training can go off and learn anything and they'll be fine. Um, you know, you mm. tell them, okay, I want you to, you know, learn Revit and go and, um, I don't know, mm. do road infrastructure or something. They'll just learn how to do it yeah, and, yeah. you know, <laughs> off they'll go. Um, yeah. But they could just as easily go and become a product designer mm. and, you know, design a car body or something. Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of think trying to um, attach, you know, technical proficiencies um, to the, the sort of the university outcome Mm. Um, I think is pretty dangerous. So I know, I mean, RMIT architecture, um, I think it's kind of a fairly uh, exceptional mm -hmm. uh, course yeah. uh, in Australia. But, um, you know, like even by sort of world standards, um, we certainly get pretty good feedback on the mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. work we're doing, the kind of interests yeah. that are um, fostered. So like I know at other universities, it is more like a, 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 a sort of a vocational yeah. um, training. You know, yeah. you are being taught how to be an architect. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, look, I, I, from my own kind of personal perspective, I think, you know, um, within the architecture course, I don't think it's unreasonable to um, introduce people to some of the, the kind of the, the, the technical aspects of it. So, um, mm -hmm. You know, you might do some projects in Revit and get a bit of guidance on it and um, get a sense of BIM. But, I mean, I don't know, most um, most young kids now, you know, pick up the idea really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that sort of, well, it is kind of like object-oriented programming, you know, sort of mm -hmm. entities with data in them. Like it's mm -hmm. not a, they haven't come from AutoCAD, so they haven't kind of... Um, you know, already consigned drawing to being a particular thing. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't think I would be um, teaching, you know, yeah, I, de I definitely wouldn't be trying to teach, you know, BIM management as a, as a subject. And I, mm -hmm. I kind of mm -hmm. think, um, you know, as long as someone graduates as a well-formed, um, you know, graduate mm -hmm. architect with mm -hmm. all of that, sensibility yeah then you know any of the next stuff that happens mm -hmm. um they'll be able to do and you know it it takes a long time you know you you're still a young architect when you've been practicing for 20 years so mm. um i sort of think what's the rush you know you don't mm -hmm. you don't need to become the final thing mm. while you're still at university you know take mm. that time at university to have a really broad education yeah uh, and then you can specialize as much as you like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's yeah. yeah, that's um, the education I found that is very different, dip, dip, like each country. Um, Korea yeah. is very technical. Um, it's feel like more engineering course than architecture course in Korea, where in Australia, when I was study bachelor of study, it was really like there are certain degree of freedom. You can explore a lot of things in cultural aspect, historical aspect, um, technical aspect, and also design. Um, I think it's really good balance. Um, mm -hmm. For example, in, in, in Austria or Germany, a lot of architectural university, they don't even teach 20th century of architecture history. You know, it, it's really, it, it, I'm not joking. It's very surprising. Surprisingly, they don't like, some of which, students. Which century do they get up to? <laughs> they, some of they more focus on local history or Austrian architecture. I mean, it's it's reasonable. I may, I understand, but some of students mm. they really don't know like modern architecture. You know, like whole the path and the history of the architecture. I found yeah. this really strange because I think in Germany or Austria, they are most of architecture school. It's not detached. They are belong to technical university and they really focus on a lot of technical stuff like how to detail it, 
what's the regulation, right? like a lot of like this kind of the cost estimation and et cetera, and et cetera. And I found yeah. it's very different than a uh, university in Australia. So I don't know what, what is exactly correct way or, but yeah. Oh, look, I think, I think the level of variations probably, mm. you know, the, the best outcome um, and certainly, you know, like my experience at RMIT really suited me and then, mm -hmm. you know, going back and teaching there also really suited me. But um, And so, you know, I think that's the best way. Mm. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also very glad that there are other um, approaches. Um, and, you know, like even if you just, I mean, it's a bit hard to kind of pigeonhole things, but if you look at the sort of architectural um, outcomes, you know, from country to country, mm. Um, you know, there's wildly different stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for those, um, for those countries that have sort of quite a strong engineering component in their architectural education, um, you know, they can probably be a bit more daring with their mm -hmm. sort of um, structure. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whereas in Australia, we don't have that um, engineering background. Mm. Um, and, you know, you can sort of guess, <laughs> you can take an educated guess um, yeah. at, you know, what might be possible, but mm -hmm. it's always going to be difficult to push it past mm -hmm. sort of what you've done before or what you've seen before. Yeah. Um, whereas obviously, you know, if you have that engineering mm. um, background, you've got a little bit more um, ability, I think, to, mm. you know, think of even sort of um, more advanced outcomes. Mm -hmm. Mm. Oh, I think know. yeah, Australia is one of the unique country where the every discipline or architects in, like I don't know salary is also balanced uh, in comparison to engineering office. I mean in Europe it's big difference. Engineers are much uh, much better respected. <laughs> I don't know. I feel they are much oh, same, more. Same in yeah. Australia. Same yeah. in Australia, yeah. no? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Where, I mean, I think that's the yeah. global. Basically, the best. The best paying job in the entire world is mm. engineer mm. Um, and yeah and, and and also in terms of what you can do with your career so you know if you mm. look at all those people in the un sort of doing amazing things mm. a lot of them have got engineering backgrounds mm. Mm. Um, and it really is uh, you know and it's i sort of think it's not a dissimilar um mm. to you know mm. learn architecture is you don't have to then become an architect mm -hmm. um but the, the the kind of um ability to think yeah uh lets you do all sorts of things and, and that's very true with engineering yeah um that um you know there, there's there's a way of uh, ordering the world mm. um which you know then makes you a real weapon uh mm. in a whole lot of other uh, mm. situations mm. Um, yeah. yeah right i mean yeah it's some point but I really never regret studied architecture. Um, there are oh, so too late now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I have my last question because, like, nice. interview. I'm sorry, it's been a bit uh, longer than I expected, but uh, I'm really enjoying the interview today. Oh, sorry, my, just me rambling on. Yeah, my last question is um, like. As time goes on, I'm like trying to learn every like every day something new. For me, even learning German language every day is new. Um, you so, must have quite a few languages by now. Um, surprisingly, my old language skills going down. Like my Korean language skill is, you know, stopped in high school level, and English I, since I left Australia never really speak with um, native speakers so my english is also <laughs> i'm forgetting a lot of stuff <laughs> so um, the Ger germans on the ascendancy at the moment german was hit, hit the bottom from the big scratch and getting a bit better but you know still it's very difficult language i i must say so um yeah my language level is like really like everything shooting down at the same time i'm also trying to learn c sharp or javascript so like programming language skill getting a bit better, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but um, yeah. I what I'm interesting these days. Um, I'm not working in architect's office and uh, for a while. So last one and a half years, I'm uh, more interested in developing some like application or like um trying to come up with 
like a virtual reality or mixed reality game engine integration. So as a hobby, I'm running this sort of mainly researching about virtual reality and how how does it work or the cameras you know like or the hardwares and also you know trying to catch up she shop for unity 3d and etc and etc what is your interest now if you have time what would you like to learn oh <clears throat> it is um such a very difficult question which uh, yeah, might have a couple of simple answers. <laughs> um, oh, look, it's kind of funny. I, I suppose the thing, and it's interesting sort of talking about languages um, and, you know, if you're not using it, it's just sort of slowly, you know, mm -hmm. going down and down. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, in, um, in Melbourne, we've now had um, a bit over 200 days of lockdown since the start wow. of the pandemic. Um, so, you know, really haven't sort of, been outdoors that much and mm. yeah for me it's sort of like it's a lot of the outdoor skills which <laughs> i'm um really missing and um mm. i don't know um i like uh, to go out and uh, ride motorbikes on the weekend mm. and i invested an awful lot of time and effort in getting better at it mm. and mm. you know I'd always find at the end of winter, you know, first couple of rides, I'd be a bit rusty and I'd have mm. to kind of you know, I'd be starting from a bit further back yeah. and I'd be going through, you know, particular roads a bit slower than I had before <laughs> and I'd have to kind of build it up again and then, and then go a little bit further. But um, at the moment, the skill that I really want to kind of not lose um, is the, is the riding ability. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> so um, yeah. That's interesting. But, but, and look, that's partly just being, stuck in indoor you know we just can't travel and sure um, so you know but i mean yeah from from sort of i, I, I suppose the skills that i am learning that i can um mm. um i've been i suppose yeah i mean all of those programming languages um are, are things that i'm really sort of trying to push forward on um <laughs> particularly with c sharp and sort of writing some some proper apps, you know, sort of going a bit beyond just, mm -hmm. you know, console programs um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, sort of building proper um, user interfaces and, um, uh, and and that sort of thing. And that, I suppose that's quite work related. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can see things that I would like to do mm. um, at work and mm -hmm. then there's an opportunity. So, sure. Sure. Um, but just for fun, you know, I've sort of been, you um, I suppose starting from scratch a bit with electronics, um, mm -hmm. and so um, yeah, I've been you know sort of uh, it's been going on for about six or eight months uh, building a weather station, wow. um, <laughs> and um, but you know some of that's kind of fun because it requires fabrication, mm. uh, and I don't have a three D printer, so you know I'm having to learn how to do some um, sort of like. A sort of silver brazing mm. um, using brass to kind mm. of you know fabricate this thing out of metal for the mm. to uh, measure the rainfall and <laughs> and then um, and get a I've got some uh, raspberry pies and things like that to sort of um, do all the sensing and um, interesting yeah. it, it, it's all going to be remote so it's got to be able to upload all of its data mm. uh, to a web server and. Mm. And then just, you know, trying to calculate the size of battery I need and the solar panel and, you know, mm. so like um, it's actually been quite nice to sort of, you know, um, I suppose it's that same thing, you know, it's, it's those kind of physical projects because, mm. um, you know, like working in architecture, I mean, you don't produce the buildings, you know, mm. you, you produce the documentation, documentation. But, mm. you know, somebody else actually sort of is involved in the, the physical outcome of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, th I think some of the um, it, it's nice doing some kind of um, external things. Um, you know, it still seems to have some kind of technology involved. Mm. But, um, yeah, just, you know, making 3D stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. I mean, I keep thinking if I had a 3D printer, the job mm. would have been done, you know, in about two days. Mm. Uh, it's so easy. But, <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, um, so I suppose that's kind of, the um the main things that i'm learning um and actually the other thing which is you know i suppose new and again it's a bit of an outdoors thing but um i mean you know mm. stuck in the city a fair bit but 
Um, I've been trying to learn how to go more slowly when I'm outdoors in the in the country. Oh, wow. Um, um, well, yeah, it's I've got to kind of consciously try and, um, you know, move mm. much more slowly and, and be more aware. Um, right. And uh, it's paying off because I'm finding all sorts of, you know, interesting yeah. things on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, it's a, it's actually, um, you know, so so much of what I'm doing is about, you know, doing things a bit faster and more efficiently, mm-hmm. and, you know, sort of, you know, going from A to B. Um, and yeah, it's actually been um, a difficult skill to, to start learning is actually mm. just stopping that process mm. and just going, all right, you know, yeah. yourself six hours mm. and you might not get very far, you know, mm. and you don't have a plan and just sort of, uh, yeah, uh, working with that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Look, some of that's a bit sort of arbitrary, but, um, yeah, I mean, I've always got, you know, mm soldering iron or a multimeter somewhere and, <laughs> and, uh, and a bit of code sitting in notepad but um yeah <laughs> as much as anything i'm also trying to you know break away from a bit of that as well yeah but, interesting uh, yeah yeah but look i mean yeah it's that kind of thing of i can't imagine not learning mm. um yeah I'd, I'd hate to just kind of stop yeah um and Never stop yeah yeah and i I don't think I really mind what it is that I'm learning mm. as, as much as the, you know, just the, mm. um, the, the acquisition of, of new and interesting things. Mm. Um, That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, wow. Uh, like, hard, hard to find time for it. Yeah, <laughs> I think your head is like a, the, the fountain head, <laughs> like really every, so much things going well, on. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean, it is already full. So anything yeah. that I learn now, it pushes something else out. Um, <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I mean that that's definitely problematic. I've got to be quite strategic about what I learn. Mm. Um, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> but that's really like nice. I I like that you're trying to learn how to be slower than you know walk walk slower. I mm. remember every student's architecture school they learn their walks too fast. <laughs> I don't know. Everyone is hurry and ru- running, running and submitting, submitting, printing out. I, I don't. Know. Yeah, I, I was yeah. very shocked. <laughs> But no, uh, I I like enjoying walks, working slowly these days. I also it's mm. really nice. Um, I heard a really good thing, um, and this sort of goes back to the the motorbikes, but. Um, mm. Someone said, you know, the really fast riders mm. have really slow hands. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, you're just doing things slowly and deliberately. Um, and if, you know, you're all frantic. Uh, you're probably actually not going to go that quickly. So, yeah, um, yeah I, th- I think there's definitely a, uh, a balance to strike. Um, but, yeah, look, I'm still frustrated if I'm walking and there's, like, slow walkers in front of me yeah. uh, you know, in, in the city. Um Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Architecture definitely teaches fast walking. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Thank you very much for today's interview, Peter. And it's uh, early in the morning in Australia, and I uh, appreciate your like time. And um, yeah, anytime if you anytime visit Eastern Europe or in Vienna, I'm really happy to catch up. And yeah, yeah like almost yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, well, you know, I've been vaccinated now, so yeah. um, you know, re- ready to go. But yeah, um, yeah at, at the moment we can't um, can't leave the state, and I'm not meant to go more than five kilometers from home at the moment. Um, so, uh, well, very yeah, strict. Yeah, yeah. yeah, But, yeah I, I, just dreaming of travel. Yeah, it's really interesting because 11 years ago I was just a student of your your your, your techno- te- technology class, and you know. Now, after 11 years, I'm very surprised that you are still catching up all these things and at the same time still teaching, which is, I, yeah. I think it's really, like, it's really passion because I, I like to teach, but I sometimes I'm not that patient, you know, <laughs> even, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I wish you all the best um, and hopefully we can oh, catch likewise, up soon. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, thank you for the uh, opportunity. It's been, um, yeah, they're difficult questions um, to try and, you know, 
yeah. work out what it is that you think that you do. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting opportunity. And yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think a lot of people who listened or students or practice architects, they will uh, really appreciate our discussion, at least from what you're what you hearing from you. It's very, very uh, uh, helpful information. I mean, it's experience, right? Like, honest experience from you. So, yeah. Or at least, you know, good, good examples of what not to do. Um, <laughs> no, the other way around. <laughs> okay, Peter, then I wish you have a nice weekend and we uh, catch up from time to time. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Park. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.